If you're looking for filters, you came to the wrong place. This is Filter Free Radio with Jacob Dean. Dan, with a small disorganized protest on Wall Street in Lower Manhattan here in New York, has grown to demonstrations nationwide. Get out of here, Filter Free Radio, live every Monday, 7 to 9 p.m. Eastern, on the Ustream home of Nicole Sandler, radio or not, and FilterFreeRadio.com. Occupy Wall Street protesters identify themselves as the 99% that will no longer tolerate the greed and corruption of the 1%. If you kill Wall Street, there'll be nobody else. Great job. Wall Street is Main Street. That's all we do on Wall Street. We finance companies. And companies are people. There seems to be no turning back as demonstrators express their outrage at what they call the injustices of the U.S. economic system. Occupy Wall Street! All day, all day. But what exactly is their message? I hope that the system changes towards inclusion. And that's it. And that's what I love about this so far is that people are peaceful, they're respectful, and that it seems to come from a place of love. And, and uh, that's where you want to be. Do not fuck this up! We welcome them with love and respect. We welcome them with love and respect. Revolutions are not made on protests. Protests are simply demonstrating. Revolutions are made by seizing power, seizing control, and seizing power. And the way you do that is by making real demands and agitating for them. And welcome to Filter Free Radio. My name is Jacob Dean. Thank you so much for joining us. We are broadcasting live. It is December 19th, Monday evening, 7 o'clock. Uh, e- uh, yeah, in the evening, 7 o'clock on the East Coast. Um, please check out our website, filterfreeradio.com. Holy Occuthon! <laughs> we made it, Batman. Oh, my goodness. We are recovering still from a fantastic and very successful, delightful, um, and uh, I thought just all around amazing broadcast we did over the weekend. And by we, I mean the folks at Radio or Not. Um, and again, if you're joining us on Radio or Not and uh, you missed Occuthon. Or I don't you, care. <laughs> or you don't know what Occuthon was or, you, um, or you're like uh, our, our Soundbox, the official voice of um, the Soundbox of Filter Free Radio. And you I don't, don't care. Uh, you might be interested in checking out the complete archive of Occuthon, and thank you to Shano, who's put this together over at Occuthon.com. If you missed any of it, it is there, up, uh, ready to go for your viewing pleasure, uh, and please check it out. We put a heck of a lot of work into Occuthon, and, um, <laughs> and I thought it was amazing. So I just want to open the show with that and say thank you again to everyone who participated in that. And uh, and tip of the hat to you folks. Um, before I get too far into the program here, let's g- uh, welcome the fantastic uh, co-host of Filter Free Radio and official now producer of <laughs> of Occupon, or at least the um, Filter Free segments. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome to the show Skeptical Scott. Hello. <laughs> yeah, I'm still recovering. We're here. Um, uh, truth be told, it was it was a it was kind of a struggle to uh, <laughs> to to do this show for you, but um, to so basically oh. sleep at work all weekend. Yeah, you know, I I couldn't uh, I, I I couldn't wait to get back in here. And <laughs> no, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Um, but uh, we actually have a believe it or not, uh, Scott and I were able to uh, make uh, some magic happen. Pull on the. Uh, Strings, as as Kenny Pick's intro says, pull the string. Um, we actually have a fine show for you this evening, I think. Uh, coming up in our second hour, in about an hour from now, joining us live on Filter Free Radio, if the powers to be allow it, uh, Buddy Romer is going to be joining us, the uh, Republican presidential candidate and um, big advocate of getting money out of Congress, money out of, out of Washington, D.C., will be joining us. Buddy Romer. So um, let's uh, let's see if, if Buddy joins us. We're we're planning on that at the moment, and uh, so stick around for for Buddy coming up in about an hour from now. And uh, and you know we got some other things to talk about. A um, lot of news, a lot of news happenings uh, going on over the weekend. Um, and uh, uh, besides Occupy. <laughs> 
And, and, a, and a lot of things going on. I want to I want to get you up to date, kind of on you know some news stories that have caught my eye, um, and Scott's as well. Uh, Scott's got some. Actually, you know what Scott's been working on? We're going to get into a little bit later in the program. S- Scott's been cutting up a bunch of really brilliant, amazing audio uh, jewels to share with you. And uh, wh- what are you laughing at? I'm just laughing because I. It's like I don't want to play those. <laughs> you don't want to play them? I thought you said you didn't want to play them. No, I was just kidding. All right. We're we're having what Scott and I are experiencing right now is sleep deprivation and um, confusion over (laughs) the direction. (laughs) But long story short, um, this is John Pilger. Am I saying that right? uh, Yeah, John Pilger. Pilger. And we've had this video up on our website, filterfreeradio.com, for probably a couple of weeks now, going on uh, two, three weeks. And the reason that we've left it up on the front page is because it is brilliant. Uh, he actually lays out within about a 25-minute span um, really, you know, a lot of problems and a lot of solutions and, frankly, a lot of language that people are afraid to use. Um, and on a, on a wide ver- uh, variety of topics, he actually, you know, uh, criticizes Obama a little bit. He criticizes things like moveon.org, things like this. Um, and we're going to get into that a little bit. So I think that's going to be fun. And Scott um, is is becoming quickly the mass producer of uh, Filter Free Radio. This is great. Uh, I confess I don't have the entire speech cut up, so I have parts of it. but uh, And they may be out of context even, but, you know. It's still good stuff. Yeah, and, w- and w- we'll get into that a little bit. And uh, because we do have a pretty jam-packed show today, um, we might, uh, or tonight rather, we might get into that a little bit next week, too. So I think we can we can plan on a really good, solid John Pilger show next week. Yeah, next week, week would probably be best. Um, but we do have a little bit of that to share with you. So a little bit of sneak, uh, sneak peek, uh, tease, get the hook in there. Um, real quick, some news that I think you need to know. Uh, over the weekend, things have been happening. Of course, we at uh, Radio or Not were preoccupied with Occupy or Occuthon. Uh, I haven't said the O word, by the way, all day long. <laughs> I just That's how much I was like, okay, I need to separate myself from the Occu for a while. Um, of course, after uh, the broadcast, I went home and occupied the bed for about 24 hours <laughs> and <laughs> was rudely awakened to come to work. But that's okay. Uh, I want to talk about a couple of things in the news. Um, did you know that finally the Fannie and Freddie, or at least a couple of them, Fannie and Freddie uh, CEOs have been charged in the 2008 uh, financial crisis meltdown? Um, speaking of ex Fannie Mae CEO Daniel Mudd and ex uh, Freddie Mac CEO, or you say it was CFO, right? Uh, Richard Siron. Um, was that right, Scott? Huh? <laughs> okay, <laughs> bear with us. Richard uh, who? I, I'm sorry, I don't know the, the CEO of, of uh, Freddie Mac. Was I, it? I, only wor- I worked for Fannie Mae, so yeah, it's it's a... Uh, oh, you're talking about Daniel Mudd then? Yeah, Daniel Mudd. He was actually CFO. He's promoted CFO. to CEO after they fired the, the previous guy. Okay. But Thank yeah, he was, he was corrupt. Uh, both of those fellows, Daniel Mudd and Richard Siron, and my apologies if I'm mispronouncing the name on friday now this was this friday uh just right before the weekend became the highest profiled individuals to be charged in connection with the 2008 financial crisis and this was in a lawsuit filed in new york uh by the securities and exchange commission they brought civil fraud charges against six former executives at the companies so uh a little a little beacon of bright light in a uh, forever seemingly sea of darkness. <laughs> that's that's a good sign. Also, um, you know, I don't want to I don't want to g- get into this too much uh, because I, you know, I, I, I frankly, d- I'll be honest with you, I don't know too much about him, nor did I really uh, agree with him. But over the weekend, uh, Christopher Hitchens passed away. I think that's important to note. Also, Scott, you were telling me another famous person passed away uh, that was probably more. Um, I don't know. Uh, somebody we care more about, right? <laughs> I mean, Christopher Hitchens was great, but he was a pompous uh, right. atheist. Uh, right, right. That's, that's now, there's anything wrong with athe- atheism, but he was an asshole about it. Right. <laughs> he, he sort of bec- made it into a, a bit of a cult, uh, or it's a long story behind it. You have to see the uh, debates on YouTube between Chris Hedges and Christopher Hitchens, where right. and Chris Hedges wrote a book called "I Don't Believe in Atheists," right. uh, which was his rebuttal to Chris Hedges, uh, Christopher Hitchens. But nevertheless, he was, you know, a very brilliant mind, and he was uh, somebody who. Uh, 
sort of, if you will, uh, altered some of the course of public discussion. But also, um, uh, Czechoslovakian hero uh, Václav Havel, uh, playwright, nonviolent dissident, and pro-democracy leader of the Czechos Czechoslovakian Velvet Revolution that toppled communism and propelled the unraveling of the Soviet Empire. He died this Sunday morning at 75. So. Right. Yeah, and everyone in the chat room right now is going off about that. Tom, Tom Schaefer and Kenny Pick. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so, and there you go. That uh, probably much more significant. Um, and, uh, and let us not forget, you know, it's, it's kind of ironic that, that celebrities have a, you know, I don't know, have a tendency to, but uh, it seems that these, you know, big prominent figures kind of go in groups of three. Um, who's the third one? Who's the third one? Well, uh, uh, Kim Jong-il? <laughs> yes, Kim Jong-il. And uh, I, allow me to play uh, a special audio clip for you really quick. Um, uh, going going viral around YouTube has been the uh, video of the uh, I, I I can't say her name and I don't I don't speak Korean or North Korean uh, so I couldn't tell you um, but there was a video going around of a North Korean um, basically a news anchor woman kind of announcing the death of Kim Jong Il and uh, it's in you know Korean it's in North Korean. Uh, it's not in English, um, and there was no subtitles, no tra translation. But I was actually able to find a, a short video on there with translation that I wanted to play for you. Um, and uh, so let me share this uh, little bit of audio with you real quick. This is uh, audio of uh, Kim Jong-il, the uh, news announcer, announcing and actually kind of weeping a little bit that uh, Kim Jong-il had passed away, and also the English translation to go along with this. Here's a short clip of that. I don't have any weapons of mass destruction, okay? Do you have any idea how fucking busy I am? I cannot believe that I actually have a Chechen standing here telling me when he's going to take a delivery. Hello? The computers are down! Attack! Why is everyone so fucking stupid? Now you see, the new world is inevitable. It's what? Ineb inevitable. One more time? Inevitable! Things are inevitably going to change! God damn it, open your fucking ears. God damn it, how many times do I have to tell you? You don't use the WMDs until you see the signal. I have worked 10 years on this plan. It is a very precise and a complicated plan. I am sick of you terrorists fucking it up. Now take the weapons where I told you and wait for the goddamn signal this time. Goodbye. <laughs> okay, I'm, okay, that really wasn't the actual English translation. If you haven't figured that out yet, that is the um, <laughs> the Kim Jong Il puppet from Team America, and I just thought that was kind of funny to do, um, probably in horrible taste. But uh, I'm tired, so that's how that one slipped through the filter. <laughs> hey, and it is filter free, so um, yeah. <laughs> and and Scott is. And I have been waiting to drop a few F-bombs, being as since we uh, managed to get almost all the way through Occupy without dropping any curse words for our terrestrial radio uh, syndicates. So, again, I want to thank everyone who was uh, participating in that. That was a, a treat. I thought we had a blast. Um, and we had a lot of fun, too. So, uh, And we put together a brilliant program. I mean, uh, at, you know, at one point, we actually had the breaking news live on Occupy of the day. With you know, with Jesse LaGreca calling in, with the with the bishops getting arrested at the Trinity Church in New York, and l literally within an hour or two of that happening live on Occupy, it literally blew up into this big story. Um, yeah, plus Dan Choi and Kevin Z's calling from the uh, Bradley Manning protests. And we want to give a big special thank you shout out to Robert from Occupy DC, uh, kind of a, a friend or acquaintance of the show who. Uh, got us those interviews, got us Dan Choi, got us Kevin Zeese, uh, live from the um, Bradley Manning protest at Fort Meade in Maryland here. Uh, and we're going to do our best to get uh, Robert on the show either next week or, or following following program here on Filter Free Radio because I owe it to Robert to at least do that for him. And he's, yeah. and he's been great giving us updates from Occupy D.C., 
Um, Plus, that was for me anyway. That moment with with uh, Dan Choi and um, Kevin Zeese uh, from live from you know the Bradley Manning protests, followed up by uh, Jesse the Greca live breaking news as the bishop was getting arrested at Occupy Wall Street. You know, right? That that made me feel so close to the movement. Like I felt like, oh wow, we are actually in touch with the movement now. And if we could do this kind of you know breaking news segments for every minute of every show i feel like we, we would have you know something that people would just have to listen to and that's really it's edgy stuff man i love it i mean we need to get more people on air from live from the uh the movements absolutely strongly agreed scott and uh before we get any further i want to um kind of do something here that's that's kind of special and actually uh kind of continue the the occuthon theme if you will um I was able and very fortunate enough to sit down uh, actually during Occuthon uh, while, uh, while Danielle and Shane were on the air. I was off the air. You know, we were kind of manning phones and doing things behind the scene here. Scott and I were. And I was actually able to get an interview with a very, uh, I think, important person. And uh, we actually were not able to air it during Occuthon because we had so much, other, so many other things going on that I didn't want to, you know, postpone it or anything. So... Uh, what I've decided to do is kind of turn this last, uh, uh, or, or turn this first hour, rather, of Filter Free Radio into kind of the last wrap-up or portion of Occuthon and play a very important interview I did, uh, Scott and I did, with uh, a man by the name of Bruce Van Vorst. Now, Bruce is a, uh, was, and uh, he's retired now, but he was a senior correspondent uh, 35 years as a magazine correspondent, worked 15 years with Newsweek magazine, 20 years with Time magazine. He also worked full-time for three years with Secretary of State Henry Kissinger um, and uh, was senior correspondent for national security at Time. A uh, latter assignment included the Pentagon, the State Department, as well as the CIA. In his final Washington assignment, he was the senior correspondent for national security affairs, covering military affairs, intelligence, intelligence rather, uh, covering the Pentagon, CIA, and Congress also. In 1992, he won the New York Publishers Award for the Best Reporting on Foreign Affairs and was the Pulitzer Prize nominee. He's been published in the New York Times Magazine, the Washington Star, Foreign Affairs, Foreign Policy, Christian Century, and other publications. He has also appeared on The Larry King Show and CNN. He's a regular guest and has produced 19 documentaries on national themes for the McNair, uh, excuse me, McNair. McLara <laughs> News Hour. Thank news you. Hour. It's, Thank it's now just uh, the, the News Hour with Jim Lara. Right. Because McNeil retired. Right. Um, and, and all of this jazz. So allow me to play for you uh, an extended conversation that Scott and I had with Bruce about what's going on with the most recent Time magazine uh, cover naming the protesters the people of the year for 2011 and also talking a little bit about how Bruce at 80 years old has become so active in the Occupy movements and I think um, this is very important to share with you and it also brings about a little bit of motivation for those of us who might be needing it a little activation for those who might be needing it in order to get involved in the movement here is uh, our conversation with Bruce Van Voorst and Scott and I will be right back after this with Buddy Romer, live on Filter Free Radio, filterfreeradio.com. Don't go anywhere. And I want to welcome uh, to the program a very, very special guest, uh, Mr. Bruce Van Vorst. Uh, he's a former senior correspondent to Time Magazine, as well as Newsweek Magazine. Spent 35 years as a magazine correspondent between the two. Has has done <laughs> numerous things. Your your bio, sir, goes on forever. Um, has spent uh, three years traveling uh, as a press full-time with Secretary of State at the time, Henry Kissinger, uh, senior correspondent for national security at time. Uh, the most recently, or his final assignment in Washington was senior correspondent for national security affairs, covering military affairs, intelligence, covering the Pentagon, CIA, and Congress. I also want to mention in 1992, he won the New York Publishers Award for the Best Reporting on Foreign Affairs and was a Pulitzer Prize nominee. He's published in, uh, has been published in the New York Times Magazine, the Washington Star, Foreign Affairs, Foreign Policy, Christian Century, and many others. He's appeared on the Larry King Show and CNN and is a regular guest and produced 19 documentaries on national themes for McNeil and Lair NewsHour. 
Uh, it's my honor and privilege to welcome Bruce Van Voorst to the show. Hello, Bruce. Hello, Jacob. It's my honor and privilege to be on your show. And, and thank you. Thank you so much for joining us here on, on Occuthon. We're broadcasting 24 hours nonstop in support of the, the Occupy movement. And um, a, a couple of things. Uh, I want to get into your article that you wrote. Um, but first, I think uh, kind of news, and I want to get your take, Bruce, on this. News of the day is uh, Time Magazine just named uh, its 2011 Person of the Year to be the protester, citing the uh, Arab Spring uh, demonstrations against austerity in Greece and the rise of the Occupy Wall Street movement here in the U.S. Time writes, quote, all over the world, the protesters of 2011 share a brief, a belief that, excuse me, a belief that their country's political systems, uh, economies have grown dysfunctional and corrupt. Uh, and, and, and I would argue probably one of the most important pieces on Occupy Wall Street this year um, in, in any publication. Um, uh, Bruce, just curious your thoughts if you've, if you've seen the article and any thoughts on, on time actually naming the person of the year to be the protester? Oh, yes, and I just read it. In fact, I read it twice. I was so taken by it. I think there's a beautiful job, a job of bringing together the diverse uh, uh, actions that are taking place all in all these various countries. In fact, it reads chronologically because it starts in Tunisia, and then it goes to Egypt, and it gets to Greece, and it gets to Spain, and then to London. And uh, it, it demonstrates how these things have uh, crept across the, the, the nation, in fact, ending up in Russia, of course. But uh, they also do a nice job, I think, on the movement in the United States, although my personal complaint, being a Washingtoner, is that they didn't give enough credit to the, the groups that uh, I think you and I have both seen a lot of, and that is the two sites here in, in Washington, the McPherson Square people and the Freedom Plaza people. But aside from that, I think the story, uh, I agree totally with you, this is probably the most important thing that perhaps to the uh, Occupy movement all years, because it gives a credibility to it. First of all, it spells out some of their, their arguments and some of their positions better than some people may get from reading some critical media, for example. Uh, the, the, going down there is quite, a, uh, quite a, an experience, intellectual and personally, but intellectually what you see is that there's such a spread of opinions and ideas, and uh, they have they have uh, grown up so much in these these periods that I've been down there. I remember when I was first going down there, one of the big signs was free hug. <laughs> <laughs> and that was great, but that wasn't really much of a political position. And uh, they were really very uh, they had ill-defined in their objectives. And I've seen over a period of time how they have come to define what their thinking is and uh, what their goals are. And uh, so it's been it's been quite an experience. I think one of the the real driving forces uh, behind the movement uh, all across the country, all across the world, is simply um, the fact that they're attempting really to address the whole spectrum of is of issues um, rather than you know limiting themselves to one position or one bill or 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 like that you know. And of course, they get a lot of a lot of pushback from the right uh, and other. Exactly you know, because I don't. I'm not enamored with that uh, title, with the name Occupy Wall Street, because the movement means so much more than just Occupy Wall Street. Of course, they are focused on some of the things in the financial and banking uh, institutions, and they they deserve it. I mean, the way that the the, wall, the institutions uh, puffed up uh, housing values in the country with, with easy to get loans to people who really shouldn't have had them, uh, they should be blamed for that. And uh, for example, one of the objectives of the group here is to go to some of these places where foreclosures are taking place. Uh, there are three million foreclosures in the country, and that really shouldn't be happening. And uh, but the point is that it isn't just the Wall Street thing. They they have of complaints and, and uh, objections to so many other things going on. For example, uh, one is hydrofracking, <laughs> about which not everybody is totally informed, but of course it's that uh, underground fracturing, fracturing of uh, stone and rock uh, to get to gas and oil, but which is also very, very uh, threatening to the uh, water supplies in the area. And, and this is just, just one of the things that they go after. Uh, they are very much concerned about the health issues. Uh, they're very much, oh, of course, a very high priority is jobs. 
Uh, and one, I think perhaps the thing that what I really like is that they have overall focused on the question of money in American politics. And that's not an easy thing to deal with because they're, they're basically two complex uh, government decisions uh, applying here. One is, of course, the Supreme Court decision in the, in the question in the issue of uh, Citizens United. And then also there's the Glass-Steagall, the need for the return to Glass-Steagall. Now, these, are, these illustrate how difficult it is for the people to make their case because Glass-Steagall is a, is a complex law and has many, many aspects, many considerations, and many applications. And uh, what they've got to do is get that reinstalled. Unfortunately, it was allowed to die under the Clinton administration. But the point I'd like to, to really want to emphasize, though, is that it isn't just Occupy Wall Street. I, I, as I said, I don't like that, but it is almost Occupy Congress, uh, or Occupy the U.S. system. Um, but that that's... Uh, why that's why I think you're absolutely right in saying that what you like too is as well as well as I do is the breadth and uh, other uh, complaints. Yeah, I've talked about uh, on the show a couple of times. You know, occupy the system, uh, and you know, kind of generally speaking, as as kind of well, it started out as a joke, but I mean, really, I mean, not so much anymore. But um, and 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 Bruce, I know, I mean, you have spent so much time working um, as a, as a foreign correspondent and overseas and. Um, uh, Scott and I were talking right before this interview, and he actually had a really uh, interesting question that I thought um, w would be great to ask. Fire away, Scott. Yeah, actually, you're, you're singing my tune here with the Occupy the System. I think, obviously, from my perspective, uh, the system itself is broken, and so there's while there's an infinite number of problems and solutions to be had, there's, uh, in a much more broad sense, the system itself is, is completely dysfunctional, both political and economical. And uh, in that vein, uh, and a lot of it is due, I think, uh, in part to uh, the ignorance factor in our, our society. And so in that vein, as somebody who is a former uh, writer for Time Magazine, uh, I want to ask you, um, I've noticed in recent, recently, and there's been articles online about it, how Time publishes different um, front page stories uh, in different parts of the world. And in fact, uh, you know, Europe, Asia, and other parts of the world all have uh, most recently had uh, cover stories that were about revolution I bet the most recent ones, I think, Revolution Redux. And then, meanwhile, the same, the same um, issue, if you will, in the United States, the cover story uh, most recently in December was, uh, you know, how anxiety is good for you. Uh, and so that dichotomy in, 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 in a, I guess, an institution such as Time Magazine, I wonder if it's something you could speak on. Well, uh, I, of course, uh, wrote for Time for a long time, reported for Time and wrote for Time for a long time uh, under that system. And uh, they're, they're very proud of these regional editions because they are focused on the interests of the people in the area. So you have a European edition, you have an Asian edition, uh, and that makes a lot of sense. Uh, it does create <laughs> ironies on occasion when you get uh, overseas, you might get a very serious political cover, and then you get uh, Kate Middleton or something back here or something, <laughs> one, of the, one of the jokes, jokes are one. Right. Uh, well, I'm, I don't know if you saw all the possible candidates for the person of the year this, this year, but there were some pretty funny ones there, uh, including Miss, Mr. Kane, who I would think is uh, really not a serious consideration. But uh, you're absolutely right. Now, let me pick up on this question of systems, because this is uh, absolutely central to our discussion. We are all asking, what's next? Where does this lead? What is going to be achieved by the, uh, by the movement? Now, when they began, they were all anti-system. And uh, there was a touch of anarchy there, but that, that really hasn't played a great role. But they certainly were all agreed that they do not like the system that exists. Uh, they didn't even want to involve, get involved with elected people to Congress. They didn't like Obama. They didn't want to support Obama, uh, not because they didn't agree with everything, but because there were some things they didn't like. Now, I have been preaching uh, down there that at some point they are going to have to come to grips with reality. In fact, um, Barney Frank told him that the other day at a meeting of uh, the Washington the Women's Democratic Club. Uh, he said, well, it's fine. He, he's all for the, for the movement, but he said that you've got to get, it, it, roll up your sleeves and get down into the dirty uh, mess of politics. Yep. Because ultimately, you've got to elect some people. That's how our system works, and whether the, these, um, the movement type likes it or not, uh, you've got to get, get representation in Congress. And so I've been urging them 
all the time. And to pick up on what, what Frank said there, uh, they are going to have to, as, as, by the way, as the civil rights movement did, King learned this well, and the teabaggers learned it, as a matter of fact. <laughs> you, you have to get people into Congress. Congress is where everything we object to can be changed. Yes, and and uh, we saw with their kind of takeover of precinct committeemen uh, in early uh, 2000, uh, excuse me, 2010, um, and then just uh, not but uh, nine months later, the the, the landslide win in, in Republican favor. Um, and and that's I mean that's a brilliant point, Bruce. Is that we need to not only become active um, outside of the system and and support the Occupy movements. Uh, and work uh, to do what we can appropriately from outside the system, but also uh, an inside the system game as well, getting people um, involved simply in in the process. And uh, we talk about talk about the whole system in general. I would say you know all all kind of resistance, all uh, movements begin locally, and and that's one of the reasons why I definitely wanted to talk to you, Bruce, because uh, I'm here in D.C. I've been down to Occupy D.C. Um, at least once or twice a week since it started a couple of months ago on October 1st. I was actually down there on day one when uh, President Barack Obama drove by in the presidential motorcade, which was a sight to see and, uh-huh, yes. and cemented my enthusiasm uh, for participating. And um, and I, I wanted to also t- uh, talk to you a little bit about uh, you participated in the in the bridge march, uh, which was part of a, a nationwide day of action. Um, and it was not but uh, about a month ago when they when they uh, marched here in D.C. to uh, Key Bridge in, in Northwest, and and you wrote uh, Bruce in your article about how that was that was uh, a, such a good model of what an action should be, um, and how they were able to you know clearly um, uh, define their objective to kind of point out cracks in, in the bridge and. And and how that stands as a as a kind of a synonym for this uh, the the nation's infrastructure in general. Um, exactly, Jacob. Uh, I'm glad you should raise that because I I'm, I use that so often in talking to people here. I emphasize to them that actions, as they call them, are fine, but actions have to have a point. They have to il- illustrate something, and they have to have a resonance with uh, voters. Now the. March on the Key Bridge was perfectly legitimate because it, folk, it had out there the bridge, a very important and historic bridge in Washington, uh, had visible cracks in it. It needs to be repaired. And it illustrates the national problem of, of uh, 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 the bridges and, and highways and the infrastructure falling apart. So, A, logically, there was a connection that made sense. And secondly, to carry it out, in my judgment, as these things should be done. They walked down the street. They, they took just one side of the street, but they, they, were, they were only maybe 100 people, so they didn't block the, the uh, intersections very long. When they got near the bridge, where the traffic is really heavy, they moved off and onto the sidewalk. So they didn't block the traffic. They didn't irritate the drivers. And they made their point. And also, they didn't irritate the police. It was a perfectly peaceful, quiet, uh, effective, I think, uh, uh, action. Now, in contrast to that, there are a couple of things they pulled which I don't like. Uh, last week, they built on, in uh, McPherson Square, they built a barn-like structure. Yes. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> you know, the <laughs> irony is that technically and architecturally and from a construction standpoint, it was a genius job. They put this thing up in three hours in the dead of night. They snuck some of that stuff <laughs> all in. And so I, was, I admired that. But the notion of spending $1,400 to spend this uh, was ridiculous. A, they didn't make their point. Their point presumably was the homeless, presumably an aspect of foreclosures. But this is an illustration of how things get out of hand. They had agreed at their general assembly, which all all the groups across the country have a general assembly, which is a a town hall meeting in in the afternoon, and they decide what they're going to do, that they would put this up. But if the police came, they would yield and move, because it was obviously obviously the police were going to take the thing down. But some in the group, and difficult types, and they're always difficult types, uh, decide to stay up there. So instead of uh, getting a positive, making a positive impression on people, 
they showed this, the money being spent for, I, I, I stood there, I couldn't figure out what it was. On top of that, there were the, the television coverage was A, of some chap being taken off by a cherry picker, and another one urinating from, from up there. Well, mm -hmm. this is not what you want. There was another example of this in the same week. They, they blocked uh, K Street. Now, in theory, that's a good idea. The point in blocking K Street, of course, is that K Street represents symbolically uh, the lobbyists in Washington. And so they were trying to make the point that this is a street where all these uh, high-paid guys go who go and spend all this money buying your Congress. If that idea can be made, it was, it, it, it's a good idea. But it wasn't clearly conveyed. I watched it. I didn't know quite what they were talking And on top of it, they blocked uh, rush hour traffic for about four hours. Now, that is not the way to persuade people <laughs> to support them. I kept thinking, my gosh, some guy sits there, and he's eager to get home for that first martini, and here he is sitting <laughs> in a traffic jam. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and, you know, there's, there's a right way and a wrong way to go about these things. And definitely putting, putting, you know, thought into the full parameter of, of what you're about to do, all of the consequences that can come of your actions that will, you know, whether you like it or not, will actually be forecasted upon the entire movement. Exactly. Uh, um, and, and, and it's so important to, you know, maintain a cooperative, respectful, um, mode of uh, or you know choice of tactics in and and like you say effectiveness how how effective is is what you're um, what you're doing how effective is that going to be and and have you have we t taken into account all of the consequences that could come of this exactly I, I know uh, recently um, just this week was the occupy the ports on the west coast all of the um, the sea all about I couldn't figure it out. Yeah, and I did. Um, uh, we talked about it on on my show this week about that a little bit, and how we uh, I had someone on from the Port of Portland, Oregon, and he was talking about how you know we understand that they're trying to target the corporations that own the docks, and you know, and the free trade system, the quote uh, so called free trade system, um, and and kind of the epicenter of you know goods and services uh, coming in and out of the country, outsourcing and et cetera, mm -hmm. and, and he was he was. Um, you know, saying that I, I get that, but at the same time, uh, shutting down these ports, you're you're hurting. You know, these members of the 99 percent who are port workers, who are truck drivers, who are simply just trying to you know do their day to day activities. And I don't think um, that movement or that particular day of action took into account the effectiveness of that and the full consequences of their actions there. And how did it actually affect the corporations? Zero, I would think. Exactly. In practice, and uh, any any delay of traffic. Uh, bothers again most of the 99 percent uh so to speak you and me exactly exactly but uh effectiveness and, and re the relationship between the action as, as you know they call everything an action of this sort and and the reason and the intention the intended message is the link that they really have to emphasize over and keep in mind all the time and uh, to, to just just to go and stand on the street corner. Well, this again is a Barney Frank. But to go stand on the street corner and show America's going to hell on a handbag <laughs> doesn't tell you very much. Yep. And that you you uh, you know that I go down there and I do uh, I do three things actually. Uh, I listen. Uh, first of all, I want to hear what they have to say. Uh, and uh, I hear I hear a wide variety. There are, by the way, it's an, people say, well, who's down there? I could talk for an hour on who's down there. <laughs> there is a spectrum of people ranging from the ter very top of our, our, our intellectual structure. There, I talked to plenty of people with PhDs, MBAs. Uh, the other day, I had a very nice conversation with a young lady, and I said, "And hey, by the way, did you go to college?" And she said, "Yes." I said, "Where?" She said, "Smith." <laughs> well, <laughs> Smith, as you may know, is one of the really elite East Eastern colleges. Yes, and. Uh, so somebody else you have a degree yeah he says have a, 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 a doctor's degree in uh, uh, astronomy uh, and on the other hand of course there are there are others out there who are uh, has no great skills but nevertheless the, the, the common bind in almost all cases I find is unemployment uh, that has brought a good share of these people together and in many cases they don't deserve it they're eager to work and that's why I was standing on the street corner the other day and some guy in a car came past, rolled on his window and said, hey, you, oh, he swore a lot more than I'm going to do on this program. That's okay. 
<laughs> but he swore a lot, and it's, the effect, the, the meaning was, why don't you guys get a job? Uh, they don't want, they want a job, and that's what they shouted back to him, but they didn't use the word he used. <laughs> well done. Well done, guys. Yeah. Excellent. And, uh, but then the second thing that I do is I watch, and then I, I'm watching to find out, again, to answer the question people ask me, who are these people? And I, I look around, and I, I see uh, a lot of serious people. There's a lot of serious uh, – uh, some of them, by the way, in Washington drop by. Not everybody that's involved and lives in those tents down there. But the, even the tent types uh, vary. And in the education and background, uh, I, had, I had a young lady that I was talking to the other day, and she, everybody has, has been willing to give me their last name except this one. And I said, why won't you? Everybody will give me their name. Why won't you? She said, uh, because I'm in a, in a divorce with the custody battle, and I really don't think I need that right now. Mm. Uh, I took that as a, as a reasonable explanation. <laughs> That's quite all right. That was quite all right. <laughs> but uh, uh, there are, I, oh, the other day I had somebody that said, well, I can't see you tomorrow at 4 o'clock. And I said, well, why? She said, well, I'm finishing up my Ph.D. orals. <laughs> <laughs> so, Brilliant. That, that's the type that you get, and, uh, and there are some others. I've got a very good friend down there who's an Alabama woman who uh, was battered by her husband, and so she still walks with a cane, and uh, uh, and she's converted to Islam. And uh, so the, there are all this sorts of people. And then I lecture. Now, my lecture is pretty much what we've talked about already. That you all are wonderful people, but you've got to get political clout. You don't like the system. But the system is the only way you're going to get any place. And I talk to the people about that. I also get them to define their their goal. For example, when the uh, uh, their, their, you know finance, uh, Wall Street is a terrible place. I said, well, why is Wall? Why do you think why is Wall Street is a is a terrible place? And what specifically is Wall Street doing that you think uh, must be changed and can be changed? And by the way, they raised one good point. I said, why has anybody gone to jail from all the terrible things that have been done? I agree with that. Mm -hmm. I mean, what, we've got people going to jail for stealing bread someplace, like uh, Les Miserables or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Bruce, what, what's, the, what's the overall draw for you? What, what is it that brings you down to Occupy? I'm sorry? What, what's the draw for you? What is the, what is the uh, I guess, the query for you? What is it that, that draws you to the Occupy movement? Oh, you mean me personally? Yes, sir. You, you, you sort of, I mean, the stereotypical demographic is Generation X or somebody, you know, under 25, the, the students who are, you know, debt-laden with student loans and unemployed. Uh-oh, and you saw on Google my birth date. No, I didn't, but you sound... Just as well. Don't, just don't, don't say it on the phone, okay? No worries. <laughs> I'm 79. Oh, wow. Uh, so, but, no, but I, uh, I think I, I think my brain is about 59, but uh, I have a great moral interest in this. I happen to come from West Michigan, a Calvinist, uh, I went to Hope College, which is a uh, uh, Christian college in, in Holland, Michigan, before I went to the University of Michigan, and uh, I, I acquired a great interest in philosophy and religion, and as a matter of fact, uh, as a matter of fact, right now, I'm writing a book on the Pentateuch. Uh, the first five books of the Hebrew Bible. Uh, and so philosophy and m uh, morality and, uh, are, and ethics are a central part of my, my being. And so when I see something like this, I, I immediately uh, think that this is something that I want to get involved in and want to support and uh, want to, uh, and I think uh, with my political background, after I, uh, I've lived in, I don't know, seven, eight countries, uh, seen, I, I've been in almost every country in the world, uh, and, but I've lived in seven countries, like something like that. I've seen other systems. I've seen all the poverty in, in Latin America and in Africa, and uh, I am really outraged that some of this stuff exists. And said, why do we have poverty here? Uh, why, why can't we get a welfare system that works properly? Why can't we be denominated by the financial centers and the banks? Uh, this is just wrong. And this is, I'm a Democrat. I'm a small B, I'm a big D Democrat, but I'm a small B Democrat mm -hmm. as well. And I just didn't believe in that I want this system to work, and it is not working. I got to mention, Bruce, that um, uh, you're talking about uh, lighting the spark of, of philosophy interest. I just saw. Uh, last week or week before last, we saw uh, Dr. Cornell West speak at uh, George Washington University here in D.C., and I, I, I walked away from that lecture, um, I mean, with, with overwhelming emotions and, and just... And your head hurt. And, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, that's, 
I mean, talk about morality and, and what it means to be human. And um, uh, yeah, absolutely. That just that, that lit a spark for me. Um, Let me mention that also that I spent almost 10 years writing a book on the book of Job in the Bible. Mm. And I never got it finished because it was much too com. First of all, there's been a lot published on it. Secondly, I didn't have all the necessary languages. And thirdly, I wasn't quite sure what I concluded. But I did conclude one thing, and that is that I feel like I'm Job. I feel like all of us are Job. We are all struggling through. I have a great sense of humanity and community and compassion. And, and I think that that comes through in the book of Job. And that's uh, uh, why I worked on it. I, I wish I'd published my book. I, uh, I got zero for my uh, zero per dollar per hour for my work, and, but I guess I wouldn't have sold many books either. Oh, that's I mean, and I would add empathy to that list. I think uh, empathy is 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 truly w- one of the most important uh, virtues that we can all um, begin to to express more. And Jacob, you know, every time I come away. I, I tell my, when I come back home, I tell my wife I have learned so much about it. I thought I knew, but, but this is a class of people. Some of the people, uh, well, they're, they're they're more obviously they're more anarchic, if you will, or they're more yeah. they're certainly fiery independence, and uh, which I like in some ways. Oh, they drive me up the wall sometimes. I spend some, I spend an hour. I bought a coffee for a couple of them. I spent them all, all with the other, trying to explain, uh, persuade them of just this point of entering politics. Oh, they said, well, we're just three months old, and this is, we've got a long time to go. I said, but these things, don't forget they fade. There's a danger that, that you run out of steam, and the, the, the air will go out of the balloon, and all those cliches that I could think of. And uh, I'm really uh, trying to persuade them that they've got to bite the bullet if you want another cliche. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Excellent. Hey, Bruce, I, in that vein, I have another question for you. Um, as somebody, I'm a, I'm a, I am consider myself a lover of, of wisdom as well, a philosopher, if you will. And so I read, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the works of Chris Hedges. Oh, sure. Oh, excellent. Okay, former. Yeah, oh, former. I read all his books. Excellent. Son of a Presbyterian minister. Um, we play Hedges on our show all the time, Bruce. Yeah, <laughs> yeah he's, he's quite frankly one of, the, one of the biggest inspirations I know in my life. And so, I can understand that, yeah. Certainly I certainly show. about his physical situation. Exactly. And so my, my question, uh, you know, using uh, the context of which I learned from him, um, you know, one of the things he says is that obviously the system is broken. We're living in an, an age of neo-feudalism, you know, where we're, we're actually... I like at, that term, neo-feudalism. Yeah, neo-feudalism. And, and, and uh-huh. also, it's also, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's uh, inverse totalitarianism. In other words, where more normal totalitarianism is where uh, the state rules the economy. In this case, the economy is ruling the state. Uh, and therefore, it's inverse totalitarianism. And what my question to you in that vein is, uh, we obviously, uh, I think it's well established, and I think much of the Occupy movement understands that we have a moral crisis in our society, you know. Absolutely. So, so as you do the least among us, uh, as, as Jesus would say. And so uh, one of the things that Hedges has taught me is that the question is not how do we get good people to rule. Uh, the question is how do we get the people in power to do the will of the people. Uh, and make them scared enough of us to do what we want, rather than being more afraid of Wall Street or or the wealthy elites and do their bidding. And so I was wondering if I could pose that question to you, if you had some sort of insight on that. Uh, it's very difficult. Uh, if you're if you've been following politics for a long time, you'll grasp the enormous influences that elected officials are under. Uh, to get uh, for the for primary purpose, of course, even when they don't like the idea, is to get elected, to get reelected. So the first thing you have to do is hold out their hand for more money. And uh, it's just the, the, co- the costs of running for office in America now are, have become astronomical. And so the little guy who really wants somebody to go there and represent his interests uh, has difficulty getting people pinned down to follow through on what they might have promised. And uh, so uh, it, it, th- this is why I mentioned some time back, I start my analysis of the problem with American uh, political structure with the the influence of money it just uh, everything is bought and uh, obviously uh, the little man has a hard time competing which is why the movement uh, is is uh, effective in my view because and to this extent we're, we're showing people maybe not dollars but we're showing that the, the, what the people are thinking and uh, uh, but but uh, you're quite right it's, it's hard to keep people honest when they get in the job and uh, you know I don't know how people realize what it's like to be a, a, 
a congressman or a senator, but it, I wouldn't. <laughs> I would never. I want to. Be, I wouldn't mind being in there, and not having to get the job, but running for office and going out and. Uh, then in your office you see I you should see their schedule. The, it's eight o'clock. Uh, the Girl Scouts from uh, Des Moines, <laughs> and at uh, nine o'clock the uh, the Ladies Club from uh, Des Moines, and at nine thirty you've got a vote on this. Uh, you know, then at ten thirty uh, the committees meet. In I guess no ten o'clock the committees meet, and so uh, and often people, often members are uh, on two or, or sometimes three committees. And so they have to go. So they go in, walk in. I don't know if you've, ever, you've seen the television coverage of them. And they come in and they sit down, and they're marked present. But then they get up and leave. They don't uh, really listen to much. For that, they have staff. And staffs are, staffs are the center of real action in the Congress. But uh, in many cases, they don't have to hear what, what the testimony is being given at these hearings. That's, that, that's a show, that show business. On both sides, the people who come in, the general or the scientist or something, uh, knows exactly the role he's supposed to play. The general has to come in and plea for the military budget. Uh, the, Cong the congressman or senator has to sit up there and ask a question, which is prepared by staff. He gets an answer, and what you don't see on television is he disappears. He's at, mil he's at uh, the uh, uh, Armed Services Committee there, and then he goes on to agriculture. If he's from the Midwest, agriculture is more important to him than, than uh, armed services. And uh, so he's got to be there. And, and they're constantly going all day. And then there's a constantly, you've got to see Mr. X from Chicago because he gave us $10,000 last year. That's how things go for these guys. And uh, Yes. <laughs> funny thing, I worked, for, I worked for, between Newsweek and Time, I worked for three years in the Senate. And uh, I would... We'd have, there'd be a vote coming up on the floor, and I'd prepare a really brilliant uh, one-page memo describing what the issues were and what I thought that his position should be. And then he'd go down and get on the, uh, the railway. Uh, from, this is Russell Building, going from one building to another to the Capitol. And he'd meet a, a, a friend, a senator's friend, and they talk about and, and he changed his view completely. <laughs> hmm. It's a really weird system, believe me. And, and that, that begs a beg, you just sparked another question in my mind here. You've mentioned before, I know uh, from my experience and certainly from my perspective as well, uh, you know, a good portion of the Occupy movement, or at least the younger generations, are somewhat anarchical or at least leaning towards anarchical tendencies. Uh, and, and sort of in that vein, uh, the belief that the system is so broken it cannot be repaired and therefore should be replaced by a new system. Um, what's cropped out of that is uh, something called horizontalism. Uh, which is uh, a term I believe quoted by Sheldon Woolen, one of the great political philosophers of our time, where he talks about how hierarchies are inherently uh, anti-democratic. Yes. And that we need we need a new horizontal system. Uh, and, and does that sound completely utopian to you? Yes, it does. I never really quite understood what he meant by that. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the, I'll tell you the greatest irony I've experienced since I've gotten involved in this thing. Here we have these the, all of these people anarchists. Uh, and they are anti-system, they're anti-our uh, structure, and you can't, and then so I go down there, and what have they got? First of all, they have a general assembly every night, and nothing gets done except uh, if it's approved by the GA, but it is a uh, consensus operation, and so they've got to get everybody, and then they get into terrible fights, and they go on and on, and then <laughs> they have committees. They have uh, well, I, I took a picture of their, their sign, join, out, join a committee, and there were 16 committees, uh, everything from some fairly logical ones, such as sanitation and kitchen and library, but also uh, they have an action committee that meets to just uh, decide what actions they're going to take. It has a security I sat in on a security committee the meeting the other night. They have had some violence. Uh, and it's not unusual. First of all, you got 200 people. In this case, with McPherson Square, you got 200 people crammed into a fairly small place, living for months now, under very difficult circumstances. Uh, uh, the other night, for example, it came, got down to 24 degrees. Well, yeah, I, know. I, I came home to my warm uh, bedroom, and, but uh, I had a great sympathy for them. Uh, I brought down by <laughs> and urged my friends, so I brought down every sweater and every long sleeve shirt and uh, a couple of parkas that I found in my thing uh, to donate to their what they call their uh, comfort station and uh, bless you a lot of people are, are doing this and uh, 
uh, they're getting. Some, I'm surprised they're getting some pretty decent donations. So I don't know what their financial. Well, they announced their financial situation. But anyway, my point was that uh, they have got all these committees up, and they won't do anything, and they argue interminably. These things go on, but at least they had the other night. They had the sense to not do it in standing out in the park. They went inside a, the Kosi restaurant, which has been very uh, friendly to them. That, by the way, is also something very nice. Some of the, uh, the Starbucks, for example, and some of the other st- places around. Uh, have allowed them to use the bathrooms, for example. And uh, and as far as showers, which are also a real problem, the, the union uh, uh, makes available the showers here, which are only about six blocks from, from where they are. So And they can go down there uh, several days a week and take a shower, which many of them yearn for. By the way, they don't smell particularly. <laughs> it's just because it's outside, but... <laughs> For uh, for our listeners who are just joining us, you are listening to Occupy 2011 broadcasting live, um, and and we're speaking with Bruce Van Voorst, uh, senior correspondent, now retired, but senior correspondent for Time Magazine, spent 35 years as a magazine correspondent, 15 years with Newsweek magazine, and 20 with Time, and uh, and an activist at uh, Occupy DC part and 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 participating. And uh, and Bruce, again, I want to thank you so much for your time, um, and and speaking with us uh, today. Um, I I to me, um, one of the most important uh, aspects of the movement and in any movement really generally is just simply participation, showing up, getting active, um, and that's and that's kind of um, I, w- I want to yeah, kind of wrap up and and ask you um, your thoughts on. How we can, because um, because I'm motivated. I've uh, the I've been bitten by the bug, and I can tell you have. And how do we uh, effectively um, kind of express this concern and get more people involved and really really start sparking the interest in in those who um, are who are I would say oblivious or or just frankly not interested or is is there a way to reach more people? Um, yeah, your afflict, thoughts on that? Talk about afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted. I'm sorry. <laughs> Slowly. <laughs> I'm sorry. It sounds something like what Jacob is saying. How do we afflict the comfortable? <laughs> and comfort the afflicted? I, well, I sort of like the term. Uh, yes. But uh, there, there are first of all, there are all sorts of websites. There is an incredible amount of blog traffic on uh, Washington. There's there's a Wash- Occupy Washington D.C. and there's an Occupy DC, which is describe what's being done here, gives a calendar, and uh, offers a whole series of other blog connections. Uh, but it, uh, it's not difficult at all. I happen to come, as I said, from Holland, Michigan, and uh, I'm in regular contact with some friends up there, and they've set up two, in a, not in a city of maybe 20,000. Uh, I am be one in for the city and one for the the, the lake shore along the the, the the Lake Michigan there, but uh, they pretty much did this on their own. Uh, they are not living in tents, but you don't have to live in, live in a tent to express it. They get together and uh, they talk about these issues. And this, the critical thing is that people understand uh, what the, what the what the issues are. And the, this is a really difficult thing because. The the core of all of this is the complexity of the issue. I mentioned Glass-Steagall. Glass-Steagall is complicated. Uh, Citizens United is a complicated decision. Uh, uh, this uh, this uh, uh, fracking of of a rock yes. is technical. It's difficult, and so people have to be willing to spend some time on it. Uh, but they, they've got. They, but they've also got to. Could get involved at some point. As this is the most core issue of everything we mentioned. Uh, they can get together in people's living room and chat with each other. They've got to organize politically. They have got to at some point begin to approach. They can set up. They can name new candidates, but that's a rough and long and dubious procedure. They can name a third party, which in American politics doesn't get very far. What they've got to do is to put influence and pressure on the existing representatives that they have and persuade them of the merits of their case. And I think that that's the, the, the best way to get results. And because the movement is growing so rapidly across the country, and there, there are now millions of people, uh, I, I can't doubt, can't, I can't, I'm sure that there will be uh, a political fallout from this, and that Congressmen and, and senators will have to listen to them uh, as the numbers mount. Parting words on that. What please. a wonderful way to end this, because that's the way I ended my piece as well. I was 
casting about for a way to sum up all these many issues. And what is the bottom line? And we've talked about Christian morality. We've talked about compassion among individuals. And for me, the bottom line of the system that we're striving for is justice for all. And I think that if we, we should hammer away on that idea, it has an appeal to uh, Christians should be paying attention to it, but every other humanist should as well. And I think that justice is, tells it all. I can't say it any better. <laughs> I want to thank, again, our guest uh, for this portion of Occuthon, um, uh, uh, Bruce Van Voorst. He's the former, uh, now-retired senior correspondent for Time Magazine, Newsweek Magazine, uh, Pulitzer Prize nominee, and New York Publishers Award winner. Thank you so much. Again, uh, we're joined by Bruce Van Voorst. Uh, Bruce, thank you so much for your time. You're very welcome. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you. And welcome back, Filter Free Radio. My name is Jacob Dean. We are broadcasting live. We're going to take a quick two-minute break and be back live with Governor Buddy Romer, a Republican running for president. And we'll get your questions, thoughts, and, and see how the presidential campaign is going for Governor Romer. Don't go anywhere. Filter Free Radio is live, and we will be right back. Giggity, 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 goo. Stick around. And I need a commercial to play. Stand by. Have you been waiting for a show that gives you the real news you need to know? Have you been waiting for a show that reports the truth and isn't afraid to call it as it is? I've been waiting for that show, too. And it's not coming from the mainstream media. It's not coming from the bought and sold corporate media. It's not coming from the news networks that only look out for profits and their bottom lines. They all speak through filters. That's why you need filter-free news. That's why you need filter-free radio. Filter-free radio is your new news headquarters for exactly what's going on and just exactly what we need to do about it. We must move forward. Move forward with us. Filter-free radio, live Mondays 7 to 9 p.m. Eastern on the Ustream home of Nicole Sandler, RadioOrNot.com and the all-new FilterFreeRadio.com. Come experience the next generation of progressive voices every weekday night on Nicole Sandler's primetime lineup at RadioOrNot.com. Liberate yourself with Filter Free Radio, hosted by Jacob Dean every Monday night. It's just the system is broken. Um, just bring it down. Bring it all down, right? On Wednesdays, rediscover the progressive south on Left in Dixie with the Left Neck Chick. Because, you know what? I think... Change is coming to this country, uh, don't you guys? Get your progressive groove on Thursday nights with Funked in the Head, hosted by Shano. It's not that, that people are asking for something that is unreasonable. It's that we're hopeful that we can have an even shot, too. Then let it all hang out both Tuesday and Friday nights on Turn Up the Night with Kenny Pick. You love the Constitution so much, but you hate the government, but you love the corporations. Where does that come from? <laughs> Tune in every weekday night to the primetime Radio or Not lineup at the Ustream home of Nicole Sandler. RadioOrNot.com. I'm Jacob Dean, host of Filter Free Radio, and you're listening to Turn Up the Night with Kenny Pick. Step right up, ladies and gentlemen. See the strangest show in the galaxy. All right, here we go. Hold your ears, folks. It's showtime. It's okay to be nervous. I still either throw up or get the runs before every show. Last night it was both. It may seem weird to you, but there is a reason behind everything that we do here. We provide people with a very important and sacred service. You understand me? I get it. I get it. Yeah, I mean, if you get it, then you turn it up. don't really want to join a little freak show. Just looking for some information, so if you could point me in the right direction, it'd be great. Live every Tuesday and Friday from 7 to 10 p.m. Eastern on the Ustream home of Nicole Sandler, RadioOrNot.com. And KennyPick.com. It's at this time of year that generous, big-hearted Americans reach out to aid the less fortunate among us, like those who've recently been knocked down by the recession and seen their incomes plummet. I speak, of course, about our nation's severely squeezed millionaires. Yes, many of the infamous 1% class are no longer feeling like a million bucks. According to a new federal report, the income of these high-living swells averaged a robust $1.4 million in 2007. But after Wall Street crashed in a heap of greed late that year, their average income took a tumble. 
In 2009, it fell below the millionaire threshold, leaving these poor rich folks struggling to make it on an average income of only $957,000. Also, talk about getting a lump of coal in your Christmas stocking. The share of our nation's total income taken by the one percenters fell from a whopping 23% in 2007 to a mere 17% two years later. How sad for them, huh? The only balm for their little financial ouchie is that they are using it as a rebuke to the 99 percenters of the Occupy Wall Street protests. See, say the rich, waving the federal report, our slice of the pie in 2009 was the smallest it's been in a decade, so your protest about inequality is out of date. Get a time machine, one front man for the Koch brothers barked at the Occupy movement. This is Jim Hightower saying, Okay, but let's travel back only a few short years in time to 1980, when the top 1% was very happy to pocket a meager 10% of all of America's income. And by the way, today's one percenters have had big income gains since 2009, while the 99% have lost income. So, the occupiers are right, the inequality is increasing. If you like these feisty pops of populism that Hightower zings out on the airwaves, check out the Hightower Lowdown. Jim's monthly newsletter provides the in-depth lowdown on what the greed heads of Wall Street and the bone heads of Washington are doing to us behind the scenes. With Hightower's saucy Texas humor and truth-telling populist perspective, the lowdown literally can lift you up. And get this, you can have the lowdown delivered to your mailbox or email each month for only $15 a year. Yes, 12 issues, only 15 bucks. Check it out, HightowerLowdown.org. More quality from radio or not. Filter Free Radio with Jacob Dean. FilterFreeRadio.com. Shopping around for a Christmas tree at the grocery parking lot. Everything over four foot three spot, a hundred bucks a pop. Slipping around for a Christmas tree. Yes, happy holidays, friends. It's getting that time of year. A little Christmas tune action there. That's a parody from Bob Rivers. Shopping around the parking lot. Go check it out. Uh, my name is Jacob Dean, and we're broadcasting live on Filter Free Radio, filterfreeradio.com, and also the home of Nicole Sandler on the Radio or Not Network, radioornot.com. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we are broadcasting live. It is December 19th, 8.07 p.m. here on the East Coast. And it is my pleasure and really my honor to welcome to the program. Uh, he is the former governor of Louisiana, also a uh, former member of the House of Representatives, and uh, the only presidential candidate who has been uh, both a governor and in, uh, in uh, Congress. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome to, to the show Governor Buddy Romer, the website BuddyRomer.com. That's uh, B-U-D-D-Y-R-O-E-M-E-R.com. Governor, thank you so much for taking time with us this evening. Thanks, Mr. Dean. Glad to be here. Oh, it's a pleasure. And uh, real quick, I want to mention, uh, it, was, it was a pleasure to meet you at the Citizens Intervention Rally here in Washington, right. in Washington D.C. at the Capitol back in October. And... Um, and, and you, gra- you gave it a phenomenal speech. Uh, if you want to watch, if you want to watch Buddy Romer's speech on that, it's over at citizensintervention.com. And um, and and Governor, I, I again, I, I want to thank you so much. I know you're you're absolutely busy doing uh, other things, much more important than filter free radio things like the John Stewart uh, Daily Show and, and Stephen Colbert. Um, and it's it's just an honor and a, pr- a privilege to speak with you, sir. It's my privilege. I'm in New Hampshire tonight. Where I have rented an apartment, I've been here for the last three months. So, so eight out of nine days, I, I walk New Hampshire, listening to people, talking with them, worried about the country, uh, wanting to wanting to have it better, and decided not to take the special interest money, uh, Jacob. You know that's that's what I do: fight corruption. And I think Washington D.C. is corrupt. Absolutely. And if you go to BuddyRomer.com and check out uh, uh, the issues page, there's a there's a nice uh, layout uh, chart there. And one of the things um, and of course, it, it compares Governor Romer to the other candidates in the field and also uh, uh, President Barack Obama. Uh, Governor Romer, you are the only anti corporate, uh, uh, excuse me, anti corruption candidate on uh, on the field. And yep. uh, and you have a plan that would eliminate corruption in D.C. and reform uh, campaign finance laws. Can you tell us a little bit about that? 
Absolutely. And the, let me make two points, if I could, Jacob. One is that I, I, I deal with corruption and the power of special interest money because nothing else will get done unless we solve this problem. Yeah. And the problem, quite simply, is that the money from the special interest, they're making so much money that they're able to give a couple of percent of the money that they're making in profit and reinvest it back in buying politicians. Right. And it's been going on for a number of years. Four years ago, McCain and Obama ran for president, and they received more money from PACs and lobbyists in Washington, D.C., than money from 32 states combined. Oh, wow. We are a nation in decline. We need jobs reform. We need budget reform. We need tax reform. <laughs> we need trade reform. We need immigration reform. <laughs> we need a whole we need small si- business reform. But let me tell you something it's not going to happen. The politicians are going to promise it, but they can't deliver. I mean, President Obama promised uh, hope and change. Right. What, what happened to it? Right. He, he, he did bank reform signed the bill, went to Washington the next week, had a fundraiser, on Wall, went to Wall Street the next week, had a fundraiser on Wall Street, $35,800 a ticket. And guess who the host was? Goldman Sachs. Mm. I mean, we've gone through Bill Clinton, we've gone through George W. Bush, we've gone through Barack Obama, and they're bought. Now, here's what I would do. And by the way, I come from a state that was corrupt, 25 years ago when I became governor, and with the help of a lot of strong people, we cleaned that state up, and it has never looked back. We went from the highest unemployment rate in America, 12.8%, to one of the lowest at 5.6%. Here's what we need to do in Washington. Number one, full disclosure. Money cannot be given to a politician without the public knowing it. Number two, It should be within 48 hours of delivery. No more hiding for a year or two or 120 days, 48-hour full disclosure. Number three, no lobbyist should be allowed to bring a check. You have to register as a lobbyist in Washington. When you do, you should not be allowed to go to a politician with a check or to raise money in a fundraiser. That should be off limits. Number four, we should have PAC contributions equal individual contributions, not twice as much as the current law. Five, we should eliminate super PACs. They are illegal under Citizens United rulings. They are illegal because they're not independent. I mean, Mitt Romney's three PACs are run by his campaign manager, (laughs) his former business partner, and his chief of staff. They're not independent. And finally... And this is the crusher on the deep. I would have criminal penalties for for politicians, lobbyists, who violate these rules. We do these six things, Mm -hmm. and we will take a major step toward cleaning up Washington. I've asked the citizens of New Hampshire, and by the way, I'm up in the polls here. I'm ahead of Rick Perry as of last week for the first time. I'm applauding, sir. I've asked the people of New Hampshire to send a message to Washington. I say send Buddy Romer. He'll start with a big broom, and he'll clean up the mess. And, you know, Jacob, <laughs> yes. I, I spend a few minutes talking about this because the other things that we need to do, stop unfair trade with China, for example, create jobs from small business, they won't get done until you kick the special interest out and let real people in. Absolutely. And uh, I remember, I'd, I'd love to ask you about that, your your plan on uh, getting tough on, you know, China standing up to yes. the unfair uh, trade yes. and, and, and help bringing jobs back to America. One of the a major issue, Jacob. It's what? a major issue. Yes. They're stealing us blind. They don't trade fairly. I've been to China many times, as you know. I've been in the plants and the factories, and I've met with government officials. They are a one-party state. Hmm. They are corrupt. 
They are communists, and their one aim is to whip America. And we ought to not let them do it. Change the tax code, make sure trade is fair, make sure our products can go there, stop our tax code from awarding our businesses for opening plants in China. We need to get serious. And I went to the Chinese embassy last month and gave that speech. You could have heard a pin drop. <laughs> and um, as part of that, um, maybe bringing like manufacturing back to yes. How Where do how would you do what that? Happened to, here, we do it. It takes three or four things working together. Number one, fair trade with China. I will penalize their products. Put a put a uh, a dollar penalty on them if they're made by children, if they're made in China illegally if they were made in America. In other words, if your Chinese plant works prison labor, child labor, has no environmental standards, no health and safety standards, that plant could not open in New Hampshire. And I've told the citizens of New Hampshire, if their plants can't open in New Hampshire, we will penalize their product. That will make the trading field level. So that's the first thing. Mm -hmm. Fair trade means level trade. Second thing is that I would I would not allow American companies to continue to get tax benefits if they open uh, plants in China. You know, they open Chinese plants, and they don't sell those products in China. <laughs> they sell them back in America. They're just designed to beat uh, of American laws. That yeah. protect our protect our health and safety, but but you start with fair trade, you equalize the trade. Any money gained by the government would be used to pay off the Chinese debt uh, that they owe to America. I would have us be free. I would have us be strong. I would have us start manufacturing plants here. When I penalize trade from China, that's an opportunity for small business to have manufacturing plants in America. So we start with fair trade, then I do energy independence. I would drill for natural gas. It can be done safely. It can be done modernly. It's a fourth the cost of, of oil. It's only 20% of the carbon footprint. All of you listeners out there who believe in clean air and bright water, we ought to go to natural gas, and we ought to do it quickly. We have the best supply of natural gas in the world. We ought to put our fleets on it. I'll put all government vehicles on it. We will clean up the air and water, but have affordable energy for manufacturing plants. Number three, I will deregulate small business. I will reward small manufacturers, not large manufacturers, small manufacturers. I will, I will have Made in America as my number one theme. I will put the flag of the manufacturer of every product sold in America. If it's made in China, it'll have a Chinese flag on it. If it's made in, uh, in Kuwait, it'll have a Kuwait flag. But if it's made in America, it'll have the flag of the United States of America. So that when you walk down the aisles at whatever store you shop in, you'll know exactly where these goods were manufactured. We've lost 10 million manufacturing jobs in the last 12 years. By golly, I'll get them back. <laughs> uh, we're speaking with Governor Buddy Romer, uh, the website BuddyRomer.com, running for president. Um, uh, Governor Romer, uh, you mentioned uh, talking about uh, going back briefly to the anti-corruption, uh, yes. g- getting money out of, out of D.C., um, and with the you know with the recent developments of the Citizens United case, uh, saying uh, corporations are in fact people or, or at least have some rights as people, um, yeah. including money is is speech. Um, how do you uh, your th- real quick thoughts on uh, are sure. corporations people? Is money speech? Corporations do have rights. They're an yes. entity formed for legal purposes to protect the shareholders from uh, personal suits. Yes. They are not people. They are not people. And we have, in our 200-year history of our country, never allowed them to speak this loudly and this freely. It's taken away speech from citizens. I want more speech, not less. I think full disclosure, 
broad limit is the way to go. But I do not consider corporations as people. If they did, they could have been drafted in the Vietnam War when the rest of us were subject to being drafted. Yeah. Not a single corporation was drafted, not one. That's that's a good point. I love that. And uh, I won't I won't keep you uh, much longer. I know uh, Governor Romer, you're you're very busy. And again, I want to thank you for uh, for your time with us this evening. Uh, my last question, real quick. I know at, at you used to be um, a, a Democrat, and at one yes. point uh, became a Republican. And with with this platform that you're running on, sir, it sounds like you'd make a a, a great progressive. Uh, any any thoughts on uh, uh, coming back to uh, being a Democrat ever in the future? Well, no. I'm, I'm a proud Republican, but okay. I'm a prouder American. And I find these parties change over time. I mean, I'm still the farm boy, Harvard graduate, undergraduate, Harvard Business School. I believe in the market system, but I believe it needs rules and regulations. And I've always felt that way conservative on some things, liberal on others. I mean, I'm not a I'm not a one slogan guy. I was a conservative Democrat in Congress, but I found my party moved away from me on trade issues, on economic issues, and on issues I thought were important. So I've I've been 20 years a Republican, and I find my party doesn't even give me a chance to debate in the 16 national debates, and I'm the only former congressman and former governor running. I wonder what's wrong, Jake. I'm I'm right there with you, Governor, and I'm at least I'm doing my part. Get you given you're the you only are. the only candidate that I'm I'm willing to have on my show, sir. So thank you, Jake. Uh, thank, I appreciate it. Thank you so much for your time, Governor Romer. Uh, keep up the good work, and and I'm I'm right there with you. Anything we can do uh, to help you take back the Republican Party, um, I'm I'm all for it, sir. Please keep up the good work. Keep in touch, and uh, you always have an open invitation on Filter Free Radio. Thank you, Jake. We'll do it again in a week or two, okay? Sounds great, Governor. Have a good Thank night. You. Th thank you All so right, much bye -bye. for your time. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Governor Buddy Romer. Again, the website, BuddyRomer.com. Please check it out. Um, how about them apples, Scott? <laughs> what? <laughs> okay, that's okay. Um, I'm, I'm questioning. Uh, curious. Um, yeah, your box is hot. Um, I'm uh, curious. Uh, I've got the chat open. Uh, curious on, on thoughts in the chat. Um, My gut says maybe. Yeah, you know, I, I agree. And uh, I, I was I, I was a uh, you know, I don't want to I don't want to bash or, or talk bad about uh, uh, Governor uh, Romer while he's not here. Um, but, um, you know, that, of course, that's that's not, and and really, I don't I don't have uh, too many things to to say um, that would be considered. Um, you know, anti Buddy Romer, other than, um, you know, I just wish, like he mentioned there at the last point, that he could get a little bit more traction and help maybe bring a little bit more rationality back to the Republican Party. I think he's doing the right thing by setting the example, starting the conversation, saying uh, things like, we need to get uh, corruption out of politics. We need to get the money out of politics. We, excuse me, we need to get, uh, you know, money out of. Uh, the government and uh, and DC and lobbyists and all of that sort and um, if you disagree with that, then I disagree with you. <laughs> and, oh, righty then. But um, uh, I thought th I thought that was kind of cool actually getting a getting a uh, I'd say a fairly high profile uh, uh, gentleman on the program. I mean, he was doing uh, the Daily Show with John Stewart and Colbert and and uh, Filter Free Radio, so. <laughs> <laughs> of course, all three of those shows go um, in the same category with each other. Okay. Uh, okay. But, um, all right. So, it looks like uh, not too many people are, are jiving on uh, on Buddy in the chat room, but that's okay. I just, I wanted to take this time to um, kind of give Governor Romer a few minutes. Um, and, really, this comes back to one of my main points that I've been talking about on the show for a number of weeks, and that is we need to start the conversation. Um, and that's where it begins, because ridiculousness, irrationality, the unthinkable has hijacked the conversation. Um, and if you look at, just for example, the Occupy movement, the 99% movement, 
Uh, three months ago, four months ago, the word Occupy did not mean exactly what it means now. And one of the most successful things that the Occupy movement has achieved thus so far is it has nationally altered the conversation. Uh, when you say the word Occupy now, it means something completely different than what it meant to, uh, what it meant, uh, you know, four months ago. And that is a perfect example of how the national conversation can change itself to uh, direct it into a, uh, into a new area, into a new direction. Um, and we all agree, do we not, that we need a new conversation. We need a new culture. We need a new system. He basically at one point said we need to reboot the whole system. Basically. Yeah, I mean, I like I like Buddy as a candidate. I like I like some of the things he has to, has to say on his platform. I like the fact that he's a, a GOP outsider, if you will, mm -hmm. sort of. He really is the mold of what the old Republicans used to be. I mean, there used to be such a thing as moderate or even liberal Republicans. You know, there was a whole spectrum on each side of the aisle. It's no longer there. I mean, it's just you know black and white these days, and even then, it's more like black and gray. So let's face it, both sides are are just you know corporatists. So. You're dealing within that realm, and so for someone like him to come in and sort of work outside the box, uh, you know, and sort of be sort of the grassroots Republican candidate, if you will, even more so than Ron Paul, right? I think is um, I think it's a good thing. I think yeah. what he's doing is a good thing. I don't think he'll win or even be taken seriously. No, but I think his message is an important one. Well, and and I don't agree with him on everything. He is a right. flat. He's a flat taxer, well, et cetera. Of course. But but by the same token, I mean he's an honest candidate, and I, and I. He's someone that can have a rational discussion with. Right, and to me, that speaks uh, more volumes than someone who uh, isn't, you know, honest. And I agree with 100%. You know, that that to me is really important to actually be honest and be open and be like, this is where I stand. This is what's up with it. I want to real quick. I want to uh, mention one more thought. We're going to take a quick break. We're going to come back. Um, we're going to play some John Pilger for you. Um, yeah. Yeah, man. Please. Produ producer says it's good to go. <laughs> I mean, I have some things, not everything. Well, yeah, yeah we're going to play a couple of clips for you. Yeah. I think is important, and um, and kind of wrap up the show doing that this evening. And um, but the last point that I want to make real quick with, uh, um, and again, I want to thank uh, Governor Romer for for coming on. I just, I mean, I am a little bit starstruck. I think that's really cool. Yeah, that was kind of funny. I told friends and family, I was like, "Yeah, Buddy Romer's going to be on our show." They're like. Really? The guy running for president? Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's that desperate for attention. No, no. I, I, well, like I said, I mean, we actually, hey for the record, he's not necessarily that that so. I mean, we, we've had him scheduled. He had to rebook a couple of times because he had some other things come up. And by all means, I'd rather see Governor Romer on Stephen Colbert or Jon Stewart than, uh, than on Filter Free Radio. But that's just me. I'm saying um, – and let me make one one more real quick point, and that is, um, it goes back to the the uh, famous saying from uh, Gandhi: first they ignore you, then they ridicule you, ridicule you, <laughs> and then they uh, fight you, fight you, and then you, you win. win. Okay, <laughs> thank you. I'm I'm still we're all still recovering from Occupy, so bear with us here. Okay, okay, but. Um, that's exactly how the process with the Occupy uh, movement began. Three months ago, they ignored it, right? Okay. Okay. Then, <laughs> after you know, after they remained vigilant and you know stayed the ground and continued to occupy, eventually they began to see pushback, criticism. Uh, people on the right calling them dirty hippies, things like this. They were attacking them, moving on to the second stage. Then came the third stage. Wait, did I miss up my stages? I don't remember. Anyways, the point is is the Occupy movement has seen this um, gradual um, – it's gone through all those steps, right? And I think Buddy Romer's position and statements and um, you know candidacy for president – is exactly in the same progress. Just, you know, possibly moving a little bit slower. It might take a little bit longer to um, come to fruition, but it. I think that's exactly what's going on. Right now, everyone's just simply ignoring Buddy Romer. But if you notice, he's the only person, well, he's the only person on the right saying things that even come close to what we would agree with on the left, um, you know, uh, four, well, I mean, four out of five of the, or, or, or four or five out of the ten things that he has listed on his site, we agree with. Um, and so, 
at first they're going to ignore him. Then once they once he begins to start getting a little ground, they take him. They start beginning to take what he's at least saying seriously. They're going to push back on him and so on and so forth until theoretically, I would hope that Buddy Romer's positions begin to take over the Republican Party and take back the Republican Party for the good um, and get a little bit of rationality in the Republican Party, which it desperately needs and is desperately lacking. Please, somebody. That's really the best you can hope for. Right. And that's what I'm thinking. So let's take some lemons, make it into lemonade. We'll be back in just a minute. Filter Free Radio, Jacob Dean, Skeptical Scott with you. And we'll be back with John Pilger. Don't go anywhere. Giggity, 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 goo. Stick around. Disappointed yet again by Sunday morning political talk shows brought to you by the mainstream media? Don't let them ruin your Mondays. Sounds like somebody's got a case of the Mondays. There's a fresh way, a filter-free way, to jumpstart your news week. On Monday nights, come experience Jacob Dean, host of Filter Free Radio. He is the most interesting man in the world. Finally, there's a radio talker who will arm you with the real facts, all the facts, and guide you through the labyrinth of fake news and false punditry. Each week, Jacob Dean throws out all those worn-out memes, crystallizes important issues, champions progressive causes, and features constructive solutions. That's Filter Free Radio, every Monday night from 7 to 9 p.m. Eastern on the Ustream home of Nicole Sandler, RadioOrNot.com, and FilterFreeRadio.com, the official website of Filter Free Radio. You're listening to WIN, the Workers' Independent News Service. I'm Jesse Russell. An Obama administration rule change that is intended to allow easier unionization for airline and railroad workers has been upheld by an appeals court. The appeals court ruling on Friday reaffirms a lower court ruling. The National Mediation Board approved the change in May, and it allows for a union to begin representing workers once they have a simple majority. A nearly century-old rule had previously required that uncast ballots be counted as no votes. Their Transport Association has been fighting the rule change. One of the most dangerous things a gubernatorial candidate can do is project how many jobs they'll create and how long it'll take to create those jobs. Wisconsin Governor Scott Walker was one of two Republicans that were elected to office in 2010 that made such predictions. On the campaign trail, he said he'd create 250,000 jobs by 2014. So far, the numbers have said he's doing everything but creating those jobs. November saw the fifth straight month of Wisconsin losing jobs. And a new report from the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia shows the state coming in dead last in the nation when it comes to job creation. Democratic Party of Wisconsin Chair Mike Tate said during a conference call on Friday that part of the reason was the misuse of two special sessions on job creation. Instead of focusing on jobs, the Republican majority in the legislature focused on passing a conservative social agenda. Instead of the laser-like focus on jobs they promised, Scott Walker's Republican Party killed dozen of, dozens of bipartisan job creation bills and instead rammed through a radical social agenda that gives millions in tax breaks to millionaires and billionaires, kicks thousands of seniors, working family, and children off their health coverage. Are the unemployed less likely to pursue new jobs? Not according to a new study released by the Congress Joint Economic Committee. The report finds that beneficiaries of unemployment insurance benefits have spent more time searching for work than those who are ineligible for benefits. The amount of time spent seeking a new job has tripled among the long-term unemployed since Congress first introduced the benefits program. To receive federal unemployment insurance, applicants must be actively seeking work. Pacifica Radio says it's riveting. This is what democracy looks like. Wisconsin's Worker Uprising is a one-hour documentary from Madison-based Workers Independent News. Get your copy today at laborradio.org. You've been listening to WIN, the Workers Independent News. 
For more information, visit laborradio.org. This is it. There's a time when the operation of the machine becomes so odious, makes you so sick at heart that you can't take part. You can't even passively take part. And you've got to put your bodies upon the gears and upon the wheels, upon the levers, upon all the apparatus, and you've got to make it stop. Listening to Jacob Dean streaming live on the web. The revolution will be broadcast. We bring you the real stuff. And welcome back to Filter Free Radio. My name is Jacob Dean. Thank you so much for joining us. We are broadcasting live. It is December 19th, 8.35 p.m. on the East Coast, 5.35 on the West Coast. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and thank you so much for uh, enjoying a little conversation there with Governor Buddy Romer and a conversation with uh, Bruce Van Voorst, of, uh, formerly of Time Magazine and Newsweek Magazine. I <laughs> Really? <laughs> really? <laughs> really? I am... I am... <laughs> I'm telling you, I'm on the verge of giving up from the, from the person who says never, never, never give up. I'm telling you, man, it's a tough crowd. We're having a tough, tough time tonight, it's, huh, Jacob? It's a tough crowd, man, and I'm on the verge of giving in. Jacob, Jacob's working real hard over here, and he's frustrated. What can we say? <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, I, uh, I had a, it's, uh, it's Monday after a 24-hour marathon with, with little sleep, and, you know, you got Buddy Romer on, and let's face it, we didn't even want to do the show today, right? <laughs> 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 so we're just happy to be here, right? Right, and on that note, I'm going to do a very special surprise for you. That's right, I got a surprise uh, up my sleeves for you at the moment. Um, for the rest of the evening, Filter Free Radio will be taking your calls live. Call now. It's the same number that was on uh, for Occuthon. If you don't know it, um, it is one eight six six seven four five twenty six sixty seven. Give me a call. Tell me what you think about uh, Buddy Romer or what you would have asked him or et cetera. Give us a call. Uh, Scott and Jacob are standing by. Okay. Uh, again, that number is eight six six seven four five. 2667. Give it's us actually, Ken says it's one Tom's Glamour. <laughs> yes, it is Tom's Glamour. T O M S G L A M O R. So give us a call. If you want to call into the program, uh, give us a shot. Uh, and ask and you shall receive. Let's uh, take our first call. Uh, and then we're going to play some John Pilger, uh, Scott. So get that can ready. I, can I play John Pilger? Are you uh, screen the calls? Well, actually, you know what? Let's go ahead and play the clip real quick. Um, let's play one clip, and then we'll take a call. Uh, we do have a call from the 224 area code callers. Hold on for just a second, um, and we'll play a quick clip, get to your call. Uh, Scott, let's rock and roll, brother. All righty, then. I don't care. Nevertheless, <laughs> I, uh, I, you, if, if anyone's seen my blog or, or the, the post over at filterfreeradio.com of this 2009 speech by uh, John Pilger. Uh, it was given at, um, I guess it was 2009 in summertime. It was given at um, the annual meeting for socialism, <laughs> of all things. And John Pilger is, um, so he's born in 1939, so he's a pretty old dude. He was an Aust is an Australian journalist and documentary filmmaker. He's based in London. He's twice won Britain's Journalist of the Year Award. And his documentaries have received Academy Awards in both Britain and the U.S. He's also been a war correspondent in Vietnam and a strong critic of Western foreign policy. Particularly, he's opposed to many aspects of the United States foreign policy, which he views as being imperialist, which I think we all can realize at this point, we're living in an empire. Nevertheless, um, I've been trying to get Jacob to play this this clip for a long time, or at least play, this <laughs> <laughs> play pieces of the speech, but it's a little bit, you know, it can be a little arcane and a little depressing, and it's... Nevertheless, um, I mean, I clipped up a few pieces of it and some of the things that I like. And we're, and we're going to get in depth in this bit next week. We're actually going to spend a whole hour doing this. And then I'm going to uh, play, uh, I also want to feature some William Jennings Bryan audio that's over 100 years old next week. So don't miss uh, next week Filter Free Radio. It's going to be a doozy. That's some high quality audio right there, I'm sure. That's it. So um, with no, no, without further ado, uh, the clips that I got in the speech anyway, at least a few of them here, uh, the, the general premise of the speech uh, was about you know propaganda and uh, his most recent book, uh, which I can't quite remember the name of. I'll look it up in a minute. But anyway, here's the little first piece here about um, about advertising. 
Long ago, Edward Bernays' invisible government of propaganda elevated big business from its unpopular status as a kind of mafia to that of a patriotic driving force. The American way of life began as an advertising slogan. The modern image of Santa Claus was an invention of Coca-Cola. Today, we are presented with an extraordinary opportunity. Thanks to the crash of Wall Street and the revelation for many ordinary people that the free market has nothing to do with freedom. The opportunity within our grasp is to recognize that something is stirring in America that is unfamiliar, perhaps, to many of us on the left, but is related to a great popular movement that's growing all over the world. Since 1945, by deed and by example, to use Obama's words, America has overthrown 50 governments, including democracies, and crushed some 30 liberation movements and bombed countless men, women, and children to death. I'm grateful to Bill Blum for his cataloging of that. And then the next uh, next clip I have here is just a real brief one. You've probably heard me say it a few times in the air, but it's a good one. The struggle of people against power is the struggle of memory against forgetting. We should never forget that the primary goal of great power is to distract and limit our natural desire for social justice and equity and real democracy. Indeed, right... Damn it. I can't get that thing paused between clips. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Nevertheless... I agree. Uh, That's great. That's a good clip, dude. The struggle against power is a struggle... Of, p- struggle of people against power is the struggle of memory against forgetting. And I think that's a really important one. And... Uh, I should mention the speech he's giving is relation to his book, which is called Empire, Obama, and America's Last Taboo. And he sort of outlines a lot of details about that. But uh, before we get on to any more of the clips here, do you, do you want to take the call? Yeah, let's get to our caller right now. And again, if you'd like to call into Filter Free Radio, we're going to take a couple of calls uh, live right now. Call us 866 866- Seven four five twenty six sixty seven. Um, that's eight six six seven four five B O O S or C O N S or Tom's Glamour. So <laughs> you can you can pick however you'd like to dial. Um, caller in the two two four area code. You are live on Filter Free Radio. Good evening, Jacob. Adam, what's going on, brother? Nothing much. Um, Good to hear from you, buddy. Interesting- How's well, how's your for having me as always? How's your Occuthon hangover? <laughs> uh, I, I have fully I have fully recovered. Terrific. Um, and uh, you know, no more final, so I'm happy as a clam. And uh, real so. quick, I want to give a tip of the hat and a big thank you to Adam. Who uh, Adam? Correct me if I'm wrong, but you were the one who introduced Occuthon to Mr. Hal Sparks, um, and yes. got, got us a few mentions at the uh, Fort Lauderdale Sexy Liberal show comedy tour and uh adam has been um ever so gracious in helping support the efforts at radio or not and ocuthon was tweeting and facebooking and and promoting and adam thank you brother it was a success and it was so much fun oh i I, yes it was a blast and um you know uh if you guys do it again hopefully it'll be at a time when i can be more active i wish i could have played you know done more to help because it was just really hard with, you know, school and finals. And oh, of course. I, when I found out how, you know, dropped us, you know, at Sexy Liberal and Shane and Danielle didn't say anything about him about before, I was like, wait, this must mean something big, you know, because I, I, I'm a regular call-in on his show. Yeah. And he has always been very generous towards me when it comes to – um promoting things I am doing, such as um, when I was raising money for the tsunami relief back in March. Yeah. He's always been very, very kind towards me. And when I heard about this, like, you know, that must mean, you know, that means something to me. It means, you know, he has some degree of respect for me, for us. And it's like, yeah. wow. Uh, what um, so. what uh, brings you on uh, Filter Free Radio this evening? You got a question, comment? Um, well, what? I... Oh, I'm sorry. That was an interesting uh, interview with Mr. Romer, and oh, yeah. I like some what he has to say, but yeah. he has to understand one thing. We can't drill ourselves out of this situation. Oh, agreed. Um, you know, I, yeah, I, I like the fact that he's saying natural gas is cleaner, which is true, but it's still a finite resource. We can't just quit fossil fuel cold turkey. Not possible. No one, well, no one's sane. Right. Believe that. Right. 
but we need to be looking at down the line because if we don't make this begin making this transition, we're going to be caught with our pants down. You're absolutely you know, you're you're absolutely right, Adam. And I didn't. The reason why I didn't really push back on him, or um, and you know, I'm I'm really not a confrontational person myself. I don't actually fend well in really rough debates where you know two people are screaming at each other. I don't. First of all, I don't like that because I don't think anyone really gains anything from that from two people yelling over each other because everything just gets lost in the weeds and. S- yeah, discussion is much better than debate. Right, and well, f- and furthermore, yeah. I wouldn't bring someone on my show that I would have to have that kind of c- debate or conversation with to begin with. So I it's think that the free radio, not crossfire. Right, and I <laughs> and, and and Scott and I actually uh, there was kind of a a funny <laughs> happening today on the Hartman program. But long story short, we shut out the poison. We shut the poison out, and that's something that I want to kind of emphasize more for everyone. Um, uh, Adam, real quick, I'll give you I'll give you the last word. I've we got a couple other callers I want to pick up, and then uh, uh, Scott's got a couple more clips we're going to play. So um, wonderful, rock and roll, brother. Well, uh, Merry Christmas, to everyone. Take care of yourselves, um, and as Hal Sparks said at Sexy Liberal, take care of someone else. And uh, there we go. For those of you in the in the colder climates, stay frosty. Stay frosty, and that's not frothy to be confused with Rick Santorum. Frosty. Adam. <laughs> <laughs> Adam, thank you for the call, bud. We'll talk to you soon. Ladies yeah. and gentlemen, Adam from the Radio or Not chat room. Woo! <laughs> um, we do we do have another caller on the hold from 559 area code. Caller, hang on. We're going to pick up your call in just a second. I want to get back to uh, a couple more uh, John Pilger clips. Scott, if you have one ready. and I have several ready. And again, we're going <laughs> to we're gonna be diving more into this more in depth uh, next show. Uh, of course, we didn't have too much time this evening with Governor Romer and Bruce Van Voorst. But, um, Scott, let's, gi- let's give uh, our folks uh, another little taste here. And then, uh, again, caller on the 559 area code. Stand by. We'll take your call next. Ordinary Americans for too long have been misrepresented by stereotypes that are contemptuous. James Madison referred to his compatriots in the public as ignorant and meddlesome outsiders. And this contempt is probably as strong today among the elite as it was back then. Yeah. I just love his accent. I know he's got that that, that Australian accent, and he never, uh, never, he always pauses between words. He never says um or anything like that. <laughs> but uh, let me let me kill this next one real quick. It yeah, goes yeah. With the last one. Here we go. Indeed, right across the world, social movements and grassroots organisation have emerged to fight free market dogma. They've educated governments in the South that food for export is a problem rather than a solution to global poverty. They've politicized ordinary people to stand up for their rights, as in the Philippines and South Africa. Look at the remarkable boycott, disinvestment and sanctions campaign, BDS for short, aimed at Israel that's sweeping the world. Israeli ships have been turned away from South Africa and Western Australia. A French company has been forced to abandon plans to build a railway connecting Jerusalem with with illegal Israeli settlements. Israeli sporting bodies find themselves isolated. Universities in the United Kingdom have begun to sever ties with Israel. This is how apartheid South Africa was defeated. And this is how the great wind of the 1960s began to blow. And this is how every gain has been won. The end of slavery, universal suffrage, workers' rights, civil rights, environmental protection, the list goes on and on. And I wanted to play that during the Occuthon, but I didn't have it ready. And I think it's just his whole speech really emphasizes the need for uh, resistance movements and, you know, civic activity and the entire skepticism. You know, I chose that word skepticism not because it's related to cynicism. It's, in fact, the exact opposite of cynicism. Skepticism, by definition, means to question everything. And so that's annoying. Um, yeah. It's all... <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jacob. It's uh, you know what what the point he makes is that you should always be skeptical of your government and you should always, always uh, rely on on your friends, family, and the voices from below. So, I really liked liked his his speech and uh, I encourage everyone to go listen to it on YouTube or actually on our website, which is a link to YouTube. But nevertheless, we have a caller, Jacob. We do have a caller, and I have a feeling this is uh you know not that um well all of our callers are equally important. Um, but I think this might happen to be uh, an important call. Caller from 559 Area Code, you are live on Filter Free Radio. 
That's the magical Skype area code. This is Kenny Pick. <laughs> and ladies and gentlemen, host of Turn Up the Night with Kenny Pick, uh, Tuesday and Friday nights on RadioOrNot.com, Mr. Kenny Pick. Ha <laughs> ha! <laughs> <laughs> now, now, Scott, you're you're being a very negative Nelly tonight. You need to uh, you need to ship shape, man. Come on. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> We're still uh, Scott and I are suffering uh, from a uh, major Occuthon hangover. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I'm doing it. No! It was actually, but you know, you guys a- absolutely are going to have it because you got like zero sleep. Yeah. I actually got like six hours, and I feel guilty. You bastard! <laughs> you got tons of sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Jacob got like forty-five I minutes. I got like two and a half hours, and I felt guilty because yeah. he slept less than I did. No, I don't even. I mean, I'm not worried about the sleep. I'm not counting hours or minutes. I just think. Um, it's important for, and this you know goes back to one of my favorite talking points. It's in the Occuthon memo, Occuthon.com. We define success, and Occuthon was a fantastic, huge success. Ken, can you share with us your, your most your most memorable moment? Kenny. Uh oh. I think you lost. I know you said Jake. Sorry. Yep. Yeah, my most memorable moment. Yes, sir. Probably. Uh, was uh, I would say mixing up the cola and the root beer in the AM shift. <laughs> what? <laughs> See now, Kenny uh, Scott was asleep again at this moment when I was uh, trying to take calls and and try to hang trying to hang with you and and Tom Schaefer. Um, I I literally rolled off of the air mattress on the floor here and popped on the mic and was trying to maintain conversation with you guys. So anything that I said in that uh, 7 a.m. hour, uh, please do not hold it against me. Uh. Oh, I, I listened. I, I went back and I listened to that full three hours, and it was fantastic. Um, but what was most memorable for me, though, I kid, though, was, was hour 22, uh, that the inf- now infamous hour 22. Uh, yes. That's what, what hour it was, right? Not 21, but 22? Uh, who it, specifically was that? It, it was one of the ones. It was Danielle's hour, I believe, with um, with, yeah. Uh, yeah. with with Dan Choi and all those guys? Yeah, uh, I know. It was insane. I mean, and I was like, really? This is, is, is this real life? <laughs> you know? Yeah, that was like 2.30 in the afternoon, so it was like hour 19 or 20, but yeah, it was late. I can tell you, uh, actually. <laughs> Not that it matters, but yeah, because it was before Shano's shift, so. Yeah, that was bizarre. I mean, I went back and watched that video, and I was like, "Wow, how'd she keep it all together?" <laughs> I can tell you from my pr- my from my producer notes, really quick. At uh, around two forty-five to three o'clock Eastern time was when uh, Kevin Z, Stan Choi, um, and then shortly following that, about an hour later, Jesse the Greco was on at about three thirty. Um, wow! So about forty-five minutes later, yeah, that was crazy, dude. Yeah, it was just it was nonstop. I know my head would have would have blowed up if that would have been me. So, uh, but I have to say, I, I was really happy to talk to you know Sam Cedar and uh, you know all the different Occupy folks that, that we called and called in and um, uh, Lee Camp was fantastic. You know, so I mean everybody was great. It was it was incredible. Yeah, you know the difference too. The biggest thing for me I noticed is in terms of all of our shows was that we had uh, just an infinite amount of people we put on the air. You know, compared to mm-hmm. compared to any one of the normal shows, I mean, at any given time, you know, one of our shows was putting ten to fifteen people on the air. You know, it was just yeah. Um, oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And and you know what, what was stunning to me too is the the different flavor all the way through the Occupy. I kept, think kept it really interesting because of the variety of you know, well, the way we host our shows obviously very different, and the co-hosts we had with us, and you know, then add to that two more layers with you know guests and calls and it just like had you know it was uh it was like that forrest gump box of chocolates you know (laughs) amen to that you never know what you're gonna get you never know but uh ultimately (laughs) i think it turned out great and everyone who who contributed participated uh you know who you are and you should i mean everyone should honestly feel proud and and feel really good i mean all everything said and done um, I actually I remember walking out of the studio here after 20, you know, actually, I mean, not to mention, you know, we did the Hartman program that Friday morning. So we were actually in the studio for probably about 34, 35 hours. And well, you were anyway. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> after, you know, after leaving and going home, 
I actually, I mean, I, I was so motivated by Occupy and everything. I just sat at my computer once I got home, worked a few more hours on the videos, put up the videos on the website. I was just so pumped, and it was fantastic. I hope we get to do it again eventually. Um, and maybe, yeah, can, maybe can we always have shows that are that heavily produced? That's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yeah, no shit. What, uh, what's it take to get Shano to produce all of our shows? <laughs> Pay. <laughs> <laughs> Money, um, and and real quick, uh, uh, before we let you go, Ken, we've we've only got a, a couple of minutes to wrap up. Um, are you going to be doing uh, uh, turn up the night tomorrow? And if so, any uh, thing you'd like to plug or tease or or get that hook in there? Well, oh God, yeah, we're doing turn up the night tomorrow. It's going to be a blast, and I think you and I are going to be doing uh, uh, Left and Dixie again this Wednesday. Yes, uh, yes, for the the Left Neck Chick, Miss Danielle, uh, our pleasure. So, uh, but yeah, tomorrow I don't think we, uh, I don't really have anybody lined up for the show just yet. Uh, no worries. Because again, I did have a little bit of uh, uh, Occupy hangover, uh, but uh, um, that P.S. Mueller should be with me, Tom and Deba, of course. And uh, uh, this Friday, though, on Turn Up the Night, the brilliant musician uh, from uh, Birmingham, England, uh, Tony Nichols uh, from a band called uh, Daylight Robbery, will will be on. So that our first guest from the U.K. It's going to be fun. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. I thought Graham Bonnet was your first guest in the UK. Uh, he's actually in L.A. Uh, oh, really? Graham Bonnet is, <laughs> originally was from the U.K. He still oh, okay. has a little bit of the accent. So. <laughs> yeah, no worries. That was still a cool I show, like by the way. I like those General Zod clips you were just playing. When did he turn good? So, <laughs> 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 yes. He sounds just like General Zod and Superman. Anyway, I'll let you guys go. <laughs> all right, all right, brother. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Kenny Pick, turn up the night. Uh, and also the website, kennypick.com. Check it out. Uh, Ken, thanks so much for calling in, bud, and thanks for Occupy, brother. And Kenny Pick's gone. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, and on that note, we've got we've only got a couple minutes left to That's wrap. That's pretty much it. That's pretty much it. Uh, well, I'm going to lock out the line. It's not enough time to take another call. Um, and, uh, and, yeah, so. Um, Can I play more clips? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we we got time for uh, for another clip. I just have. I'll play the last one. It's the way he play closed, play closed. You play your most important your take home message. Play play the clip that you want everyone to listen to and All to right. memorize and, and to come back next week and say, remember when we played this? How did you practice this? How did I you? Did, I did burn this onto a CD and listen to it in my car, which was kind of pathetic. But yeah, here's the very closing part of his speech. It's ninety seconds. Here we go. Okay? Go for Populism it. Populism is growing once again in America, evoking a powerful force beneath the surface which has a proud history. From such authentic grassroots Americanism came women's suffrage, the eight-hour day, graduated income tax, public ownership of railways and communications, the breaking of the power of corporate lobbyists, and much more. In other words, real democracy. The American populists were far from perfect, but they often spoke for ordinary people, and they were betrayed by leaders who urged them to compromise and merge with the Democratic Party. That was long ago, but how familiar it sounds. My guess is that something is coming again. The signs are there. Noam Chomsky is right when he says that mere sparks can ignite a popular movement that may seem dormant. No one predicted 1968, no one predicted the fall of apartheid, or the Berlin Wall, or the civil rights movement, or the great Latino rising of a few years ago. I suggest that we take Woody Allen's advice and give up on hope. <laughs> and listen instead to voices from below. What Obama and the bankers and the generals and the IMF and the CIA and CNN and BBC fear is ordinary people coming together and acting together. It's a fear as old as democracy, a fear that suddenly people convert their anger to action as they've done so often throughout history. At a time of universal deceit, wrote George Orwell, telling the truth is a revolutionary act. It's a fear as old as democracy. Bam. A fear that people will come together and rise up and resist the powers. I love that. I do love that. And he also makes a really good point there. That's, again, John Pilger. We're going to play more of that next week on Filter Free Radio. He says, turn your anger into activism. If you are yep. angry, if you are upset, if you're pissed off, if you're mad as hell and you're not going to take it anymore, well, then, damn it, do something about it. Start your own Internet talk show. Tell five friends. 
555 plan. Um, get active in, in politics. Become political. Um, there's so many things that we can be doing. Um, do something. Do good. You know, you know who you are and what you want to do. And do something that thrives on your own interest and, and um, issues and things like that. I want to thank everyone really quick who helps make this program possible. Uh, Nicole Sandler at RadioOrNot.com. Dan O at DanOSongs.com. The Roybert at CrownedRecords.com for music production. Uh, my fine co-host and basically officially now you're the producer, Scott. Skeptical Scott. <laughs> and... Uh, um, and thank you, most importantly, for um, participating in the chat room. Uh, FilterFreeRadio.com. FilterFree Radio is the show. My name is Jacob Dean signing out saying get active, start the conversation. Learn it. Know it. Live it. This is it. You're listening to Jacob Dean. Most of our leaders have either sold out, caved in, gave up. They don't want to tell people the truth. If you're looking for filters, you came to the wrong place. They're too concerned about their careers. They're too concerned about success. They're too concerned about just winning the next election for their status. We bring you the real stuff. This is Filter Free Radio with Jacob Dean. But who wants to tell the truth? The condition of truth is to allow suffering to speak. If you don't talk about poverty you're not telling the truth you're not talking about working people being pushed against the wall with corporate profits high you're not telling the truth you're listening to jacob if you're not talking about the criminal activity on wall street and not one person going to jail yet you're not telling the truth filter free radio with jacob dean on the Ustream home of nicole sandler radio or not and filterfreeradio.com and we live now in revolutionary times but the counter-revolution is Winning. Live every Monday, 7 to 9 p.m. Eastern. We're going to have a new wave of truth telling. We're going to have a new wave of witness bearing. And we're going to teach the younger generation that these brothers didn't struggle in vain, just like John Brown and Nat Turner and Marcus Garvey and Martin King and Miles Horton and the others did. And we shall see what happens. We might get crushed too. But you know what? Then you just go down swinging like Ella Fitzgerald Muhammad Ali. Ah!